Hey everybody, welcome back to another Algebra 2 lesson. In our last two lessons, we reviewed how to find and describe the slope of a linear equation, and we described uh, how to graph a linear equation. Today, we're going to learn how to write the equation to match a variety of different uh, pieces of information. So, uh, today it's all about writing the equation of a line. So, let's take a look. Write the equation of the line described. The line contains the point 6, 0, and 2, negative 6. So, in order to write the equation of a line, we have three different forms we have looked at. I have y equals mx plus b that, that uses the slope and the y-intercept. I have ax plus by equals c. And I also have the point-slope form. Point-slope form, I think, is the most versatile because all you require is a slope and a point. And I actually have two points, so I can use either one. But first, I need to get the slope. So the slope of this line is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So the slope of this line is a negative 6 over negative 4, which is 3 over 2. So the equation for our line is y minus y1 equals slope times x minus x1. You see I'm calling this my y1 and x1 here. Uh, earlier I used it as my y2 and x2 for the slope. That doesn't matter. This y1 and x1 just means either one of the points. So it, you might be wondering, well, is there another appropriate answer? Well, there certainly is. Uh, we could also write the equation like this. y minus y1 equals slope times x minus x1. And it might seem weird, since I'm pretty big on simplifying, that I would not simplify the y minus 0. But um, actually, kind of traditionally, when writing the equation in point-slope form, you like to make it very explicit that it's point-slope form. So you'll see a lot of times um, mathematicians will leave the minus 0 in that particular case. Because point-slope form, we really want to emphasize the point that it goes through when we're using it. So I'm actually just going to leave it like that, and you can too. But you could also simplify if you want. All right, let's go on to the next question. All right, the line has a slope of negative 4 and contains the point 0, 8. So I could use point-slope form here as well, but that is a y-intercept. Notice that there's a 0 for x, so that tells me that y, 8 is a y-intercept. So I am simply going to use slope-intercept form. So slope times x plus the y-intercept. So that makes that problem pretty straightforward. But if you want to use point-slope form, you can as well. That's totally acceptable to use. Many different correct answers here is kind of the theme, right? One thing I do want to caution against, though, while I'm thinking of it, you'll notice I did not change this from point-slope form to one of these other forms. You may have had teachers in the past that wanted you to do that for one reason or another, and that's totally cool, uh, especially if they're trying to get you to beef up your algebra skills. But by this time, uh, I don't want you doing that. I actually kind of want you to get out of that habit. Occasionally on a multiple-choice test, it is necessary to be able to confirm that your answer is the same as an answer choice but I'm just going to assume that you can do that. And so on a written exam or quiz, please leave it in that form. Because if you then try and use algebra to convert it to a different form, it's not helping, one. Um, it's not making it easier for me to grade. It's just making more answer choices. And uh, also, if you make a little mistake, you then have to lose points. I have to deduct points from someone who makes a mistake in my class. So all you're doing is adding more work for yourself, and risking losing points. So we're not going to do that. We're just going to leave it in these point-slope forms. Don't try and convert it to some other form. All right, moving on. Okay, we know that to write an equation of the line, the most 
useful in general is point slope form although occasionally like we just saw slope intercept form is is also sometimes very easy depending on the information but usually it's point slope form but we require a slope and a point so i'm going to make a little slope triangle here this is going up two and over one so i've got a slope of rise two run one that's two and I'm going through this point here, so I will use it. That is the point 2, comma 3. So y minus the y-coordinate equals 2 times x minus the x-coordinate. When using this formula, please be extra careful that you put the points values, the numbers in for y sub 1 and x sub 1. Do not replace x and y. Those need to be variables. y1 and x1 are actually unknown constants. The y and x need to remain variables or else you don't get an equation. An equation of a line, that is. Okay, let's take a look at another one. Oh, we've got a little bit of a geometry question here. A nice little geometry review. The line perpendicular to the line 3x minus 5y equals 10 that contains the point negative 12, 3. So we get to review our coordinate geometry. Lines that are parallel have the same slope. Lines that are perpendicular have opposite reciprocals. Remember, a reciprocal is simply to take a fraction and flip the numerator and denominator. But to be perpendicular, they need to be flipped and negated. So we call them opposite reciprocals. So we need to identify the slope of the line that was given to us. And unfortunately, they gave it to us in the only form that doesn't immediately tell you the slope. Uh, if you are able to identify the slope of this line in your head, please do so. That is totally fine. Uh, you'll notice that when in standard form, that it's the same procedure every time for finding the slope. But I'll go ahead and show the algebra. And I'll divide both sides by negative 5. And I'm looking to divide this negative 3 by negative 5. So that's going to give me a 3 fifths x. And then I really don't care what this number is, but I'll go ahead and find it. It's a negative 2. So notice that the slope ended up being the this number over this number, but with the opposite sign in the middle. So because it was a minus, it ended up becoming a plus. That's because we had to subtract the 3x over and divide by negative 5. So that's just kind of how you would do it in your head. Um, okay, now I know the slope of this line is 3 fifths. So the slope of any line perpendicular, I'll use a little upside down T for perpendicular, would be the opposite reciprocal of that. So let's write our equation in point slope form. Y minus the Y coordinate is equal to the slope times X minus the X coordinate, X plus 12. All right. So there you go. I think you have some practice problems. Yes, I am off the hook for a minute here. So you go ahead and do that. Well, uh, pause the video and then we'll come back together and we'll go over. All right, let's see how you did. This line has a slope of negative two and contains point seven negative eight. So just a straight up application of point slope form. Y plus eight equals negative two times X minus seven. The line has an undefined slope and contains the point negative one four. Remember undefined lines are vertical. So their X coordinate is the one that is confined. So it's simply X equals negative one. All right, let's take a look at the next one. Bring that over here. All right, this one is the other kind of special case, the horizontal line. It is flat, like the top of a Z. You remember that little memory device here? It's flat like the top of a Z. It tells me this is a zero slope line. Uh, the equation for horizontal lines is just Y equals the Y coordinate that they go through. In this case, they all go through the point 3 on the Y, act, the y coordinate of 3, I should say. All right, so two more in this little example here. All right, let's take a look. Got a line containing two points here. Let's find the slope, and then we, we can maybe use point slope form. So y2 minus y1. Uh-oh, I see something. 17 minus 17. 
That is a negative 25 over zero. That is undefined slope. So it must be a vertical line, which is just x equals the x-coordinate, and they are, in fact, the same x-coordinate, so that makes sense. The line parallel to 4x minus 1 equals 2y plus 3. We need to get the slope of this, so I'll put it in slope-intercept form. So I will subtract 3 from each side. That gives me a negative 4, right? Equals 2y, and I'll divide both sides by 2 giving me 2x minus 2 is equal to y. So the slope is 2. And parallel lines have the same slope. right? If you look at two lines that are running parallel, they must have the same rise over run, or else they would later intersect. right? So this is y minus 8 equals 2 times x minus 1. OK, cool. Now we get to do some word problems and I'd like you to just go ahead and, and give it a shot see what you can figure out we'll go over and some of these are pretty just a straightforward application of what we just practiced other than we're going to require a little bit more thought so uh, give it your best shot pause the video and try and work practice 5.2 if you get stuck maybe watch me work the first one and then maybe pause the video again uh, however you want to work it but make sure you're getting a nice amount of practice and thought in on your own before you watch me do it okay let's go over a the cost of owning a cell phone plan is $49.95 a month plus a one-time initialization fee of $74.99 if you get lucky sometimes they'll waive that fee if you really complain about it but not always right <laughs> so let's write a function c of t for the cost of the plan as a function of t months so the cost of a cell phone plan as a function of months would be we're going to do 49.95 times the number of months which is we're using t for the number of months and we are going to go ahead and add in that one time fee of 74.99 so the total cost of your phone depending on how many months you want to be in this plan uh, maybe it's a two month a two year plan you could put in 24 for t and calculate exactly how much it's going to really cost you which would be useful information the cost of a cab driver is five dollars for the first 10 miles uh, then we're on part b here by the way the cost of a cab driver is five dollars for the first 10 miles then a dollar 25 a mile after that write a function for the cost of the cab ride as a function of miles driven with the explicit domain restricted to the first 10 miles okay so a lot of times in linear problem situations, we actually have different um, linear equations depending on the domain. So this is my kind of my example for this one. Another one to be if you are if you call a plumber to your house or an electrician, they are going to charge you um, a different amount usually for that first hour. Just getting someone to come over to your house and do some work, things like that. Cabs will typically charge a larger amount for the first few miles and then will decrease the price after that. It's just kind of typical. All right, so we're going to write a function for the first 10 miles. It's $5 is the cost. So I'm going to make this the cost as a function of M. Uh, it's a lot of C's. I mean, I put little tails on my C. Um, so C parentheses M. Well, that is $5 with the explicit domain which I'll just put a little semicolon which we often do that or we'll just say the word for or with the requirement that uh, that miles is greater than or equal to zero or greater than zero and less than or equal to 10 so that's that's an explicit domain doesn't matter how many miles you drive you ride in the cab if it's less than 10 miles it is five dollars now, uh, we're going to write a function for the cost of the cab ride as a function of miles driven with explicit domain of more than 10 miles. So in this case, you're going to ride for more than 10, mi for more than 10 miles. Well, let's think about it. The f how much would you charge if you drove exactly 10 miles? Well, you would still be paying $5. But then we're going to be charged $1.25 for every mile after that so i can't just put m because then i'd be charged like if i just put m here 
uh, then I'd be being charged a dollar twenty-five plus the initial five dollars. No, it's just a dollar twenty-five times the miles after the first ten, and that's for explicit domain of miles uh, greater than 10 or greater than or equal at, at that value at exactly 10 these two equations get the same value so you could use either one but that's the key there is you need to subtract 10 from the miles because otherwise you'd be getting the five dollar fee for the, the the flat fee for the first 10 miles and then you'd be also charging the dollar 25 for each mile over that we want to wait now, this function down here will definitely not give you the right price, though, if it's less than 10 miles. That's why we have to express that domain, because if it was less than 10 miles, then you'd actually get a negative here, and you'd be subtracting money from that $5 base fee. All right, uh, practice 5.2c. Rene Descartes drew a tangent line to a circle that has its center at the origin at the point 0.45. Rene recalls from geometry that the tangent line is perpendicular to the radius at the point of tangency. What is the equation for the tangent line? Okay, I think it would be a good idea to use problem-solving strategy, draw a picture. What do you think? Hopefully you thought the same. So we have a circle. Its center is at the origin and the point that is at the point four five. So it must go through the point four five. So I'm just going to draw. A cir I'm just going to freehand it. I'm not, I, don't, I think that circle tool makes it filled in. I don't want that. All right. So there's my circle, and I've got a tangent at the point four five. So we've got a line here just like that. And that's the line we're trying to find the equation of, right? So this point here is 4, 5. The tangent line is that's supposed to be a 90 degree angle to the radius. Uh, let me make that a different color. Uh, I'll use green. So it's, this, this should be a right angle right here. So we know these lines are perpendicular. If that point is the point 4, 5, this is the point zero, zero. So I'll use green to match this. The slope of the radius, I'll just call it MR. The slope of the radius is Y2 minus Y1 over X2 minus X1, or just up five over four, right? Could have just probably done rise over run. So five over four. So the slope of the tangent line, which is perpendicular to that, must be the opposite reciprocal. And clearly, that is a negative slope. It's a negative 4 fifths. And now we'll use point slope form to write this equation. y minus 5 is equal to a negative 4 fifths times x minus 4. Um, just a little bit of history lesson here. Rene Descartes is indeed a famous mathematician. We have We are working on the line we're graphing it on what's called the cartesian coordinate system he developed that system for representing uh, algebraic equations in a geometric way he's he's almost the founder of the algebra 2 class that you're taking uh, the Rene Descartes was obsessed with finding the equations and slopes of tangent lines and he was able to do it on lots of different shapes including circles, but also even parabolas. But he was sadly never able to figure it out. He once was quoted, um, I'm loosely paraphrasing, where saying the solution to the tangent line problem is the most important problem of mathematics. And in fact, if, there's a, if there is a more important one, I don't even want to hear about it. That's how obsessed he was with it. He sadly passes away. He dies uh, maybe, I want to say maybe 40 years before some uh, some English guy named Isaac Newton solves the problem at surprisingly the same time that a German guy named Gottfried Leibniz solves that problem in a different way when they both invent something called calculus. So just a, a little bit of a heartbreaking story about uh, Rene Descartes. Okay, so part D. As the space shuttle climbs in altitude towards orbit, it uses up fuel. The fuel loss significantly changes the mass of the shuttle. 
The change in mass of the shuttle varies linearly as a function of time in seconds since launch. If after 20 seconds the shuttle weighs uh, 1.7 million kilograms, and after 120 seconds it weighs 80, 180 thousand something kilograms write an equation for the shuttle weight as a function of time okay i am being a very bad scientist right now because i am interchanging uh mass and weight Ugh, i need to fix that Th this should say mass especially since we have a space shuttle it's, its weight is constantly changing because it's you know getting further from the center of the earth so ugh. all right but we're talking about mass mass remains constant right if you want if you really feel like losing weight you just need to go to outer space become virtually weightless uh but if you want to lose mass well that's a, that's that's more difficult right so um we're gonna write mass as a function of time and it varies linearly that's the key since it varies linearly it must have a constant slope so let's get this the i'm going to be using m for mass um so and i'll be using t for time so I don't want to use uh, M for slope, so I'll just say slope. The rate of change in the mass, uh, we need to, let's see if we can get two points here. Uh, the mass is varying linearly as a function of time. So that means mass is like our Y variable and time is like our X variable. So at time T equals 20, we're at 1799290. And at T equals 120, we are at 88. Zero three three seven. So if I subtract the y coordinates, y two eight eight zero three three seven minus y one, I will get a negative nine one eight nine five three. Thank you to the calculator for doing that for me. I just punched that in over there at desmos.com, and then I'll do x two minus x one and get a one hundred. So when I divide that, I'll get a negative nine one eight nine point five three that's that's the rate in kilograms per second that's being lost just by losing fuel isn't that amazing uh so the equation in point slope form i'll just uh take this point here is y but my m is my y minus one seven nine nine two nine zero equals my slope times t is my x variable minus 20. it did say write a function this is this is a function but it's not in function form so they fix that let's go ahead and just move this puppy over to the other side i know we don't usually simplify these but when it asks for a function we're going to do that so negative 9189.53 times t minus 20 plus 1799290 and so this kind of brings up an, another form of a line it, it, that's related to point slope that's really very common. Gives you a starting y coordinate and then tells you how to get the the next value based on based on that rate of change. The next question they have a follow up question. It asks, what is the weight, or I should say, what is the mass? Oh, that actually does say mass. Okay. What is the mass of the shuttle before the launch sequence begins? So we have a choice. We could go ahead and simplify this down to by distributing and take it down to slope intercept form. And then that intercept would be the, the mass. You know, I have to point out only in a math classroom would they know the kilograms of a space shuttle at T equals 20 seconds, 120 seconds, but never know its mass before it launched. But <laughs> Uh, yeah, only only a math class, right? But I'm gonna just evaluate m of zero. Okay, so I've got I've got a function. So this is just asking me to evaluate m of zero. That is that is a very easy thing to do. So um, that's a negative nine one eight nine point five three times zero minus twenty plus one seven nine nine two nine zero. Mr. Calculator, thank you very much. Tells me that it is one nine eight three oh eight zero point six kilograms so that is a lot it takes a lot of fuel to go into space and it's you know we talk about uh miles per gallon for our car but it, with fuel and space travel just just think about it as like <laughs> 
I mean, think about the amount of gallons per second. I mean, we're losing nine, almost 10,000 kilograms of fuel a second. It's absolutely remarkable the amount of uh, fuel that has to be used to do that. Um, okay, next problem, right? So from spaceships to lionfish, right? Or as I, I, I want to say, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it, those of you that play Animal Crossing, this is this is the fabled zebra turkey fish, I guess. <laughs> right. Uh, the, the, the lionfish is, 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 is bad news, y'all. The lionfish, it's an invasive uh, species uh, in the Gulf of Mexico and the southern Atlantic Ocean. The lionfish body grows very quickly in these waters, in part due to lack of predators or competitors for food and space. Recent research, however, has found that an invasive fish population density increases uh, in the Gulf and Atlantic, the body growth rates decline due to competition with other lionfish. So they have no natural predators because they are invasive. They're not from this area. The, the natural predators are not keeping them in check. But their own competition for food amongst themselves does seem to keep them at least somewhat in check. So researcher Cassandra E. Benkwith found that body growth rate varies linearly as a function of population density. She found that for a population density of four lionfish per square meter, the lionfish grew at one millimeter per day. When the population density reached 12 lionfish per square meter, the fish grew at a rate of only 0.85 millimeters per day. Write an equation for the growth rate in millimeters per day as a function of population density per square meter. So let's take a look. We have the key word here is that it is linearly and they're going to tell us which variable they want as the independent variable and which one we want as the dependent variable. Uh, linearly as a function of population density. So the, the growth rate varies as a function of. We write you know, y as a function of x. So we're going to be writing growth rate as a function of population density. That tells me my growth rate is my y and my population density is my x for this problem so so population density is x so four had a growth rate of one 12 has a growth rate of 0.85 the rate of change in growth rate as a function of population density can be found with the slope formula do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. It's going to give me a negative 0.15 over 8, um, which I think is actually a nice-ish fraction. But uh, yeah, something 0 0.0875. We'll just use a decimal here. This is Typical rule, if there's decimals in the data, I usually give decimals in my value, in my equations. So 0 0.01875. So our equation, uh, the growth rate, I'll just call this G for growth rate, minus, I'll use this point here, 1 is equal to slope. Uh, and then that's the population density, so I'll say population P. Uh, minus 4. And we could get this as a function of population density by simply moving that 1 over to the other side. And maybe you used y's and x's, and that's fine. I'm just using these variables here. What's the most important part of that problem is that rate of change of 0.01875. That is the rate at which the growth rate changes. So that is a rate of change of a rate of change, if you will. Um, based on the population density of the lionfish. So, um, for your uh, exit ticket today, I want you to consider, uh, suppose you're given two points, write a description of the steps that are necessary to find that equation in point slope form. You have to do a couple tasks. So, jot down a couple sentences in your notes about how do you find the equation of a line in point slope form given two points, x1, y1, and x2, y2. And then uh, until next time, take care.